I'm going to start. Everybody think back to where you were before COVID, May of 2019. Uh, Graywell, Stranded Marine Science Center is the hub for the Stranding Network for this part of the coastline. Our volunteers, our AmeriCorps, the Carlson, our team from EPMSC responded to the stranding, as did NOAA and Cascadia Research Cooperative. From the water, Cascadia was sending information about how the whale was doing, location of the whale, sending photographs. And uh, just to fast forward, that whale ended up on the beach in Port Ludlow, on a private beach. And, and that skeleton of that whale is now going to move to Phoenix Fork in just the next couple of months, where everyone can uh, see it and learn from it and appreciate it forever. So at the Reef Science Center, we thought, wow, if only we knew somebody who knew about gray whales who could talk to us this spring before this great whale winds up downtown. And um, we do know someone who knows all about gray whales. John Kilmakitis is a senior research biologist or, and one of the founders of Cascadia Research Collective. For over 40 years, they've been, as a nonprofit, providing scientific data and research um, that's really informed what we know about whales and other marine mammals in the North Pacific. Um, John has had a prolific career. He's um, been the project director for over 200 projects. He's written hundreds of articles and his work has been featured on Nat Geo and um, and Discovery Channel. He's won awards, he teaches. There's just probably no one that we could have asked to talk about great whales who would be a better person for us to um, have here today. But unfortunately, we can only have him here on the screen behind me. So um, we're very honored that uh, this Stephen worked for his schedule and um, just sorry that he isn't with us so that you could all um, you know, just enjoy having him in person. Uh, we'll tell them how big the room is. He can't see you. And uh, I'm sure that when we get to the Q&A, um, you'll have the chance to just uh, let him know how, how much you appreciate and we all appreciate um, uh, everything that he's going to tell us today. And I know we will all learn so So we'll try to hold on for some time at the end for Q&A and find a good way to do that. And uh, in the meantime, I will get out of the way and we'll switch over to John. There are elements of this talk I have given before and even touched on uh, when I gave my last talk a number of years ago. Um, but it's a little different. And, uh, and so I was actually scrambling for the last uh, hour or two, uh, rearranging and adding new slides. So uh, this will be a little bit... Uh, of a trial run and an exciting opportunity for me to uh, talk about some very different aspects of gray whales. Uh, and, and I think that's what's really emerged for me uh, as I think about the history of work uh, I've had with gray whales is that uh, early on, and, and maybe this even parallels how some scientists uh, viewed, it may not have been only uh, me who might have viewed that we had most things figured out with gray whales. And, uh, and maybe among those who uh, uh, had, not a, had a chance to fall in love with gray whales, gray whales were maybe viewed as uh, a little more of a, uh, you know, a not as interesting whale as some of the other large whale species. Uh, you know, that engaged in a highly specialized feeding behavior, had this long migration, uh, but that we had kind of explored, it had recovered from whaling. And instead, uh, you know, both for me and I think for many other scientists, we've uh, come to learn and appreciate uh, many of the kind of aspects and complexities of gray whales that kind of are almost the opposite of, you know, some of the generalizations we might have made 20 years ago. 
And that's sort of what I wanted to explore with this title of the fact that just when we look at Washington state, uh, there are different groups of gray whales uh, that use our waters and they actually have very different stories. And then at the very end, they have some very interesting ways that uh, by comparing those groups, we actually gain some new insights. Uh, so again, uh, I'm gonna go through some of these different groups and stories, and then I'm gonna be contrasting some of the timing of some of the events with them and how they really informed us of some new insights on gray whales. Uh, I will say that uh, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, just to introduce and add to uh, what Diane uh, introduced, Cascadia is based here in Olympia. We have a, a, a long history of collaborating uh, with other groups on different projects around the state. Uh, we work up and down the US West Coast, but one major component of our work is stranding response. Uh, this is a poster we do that kind of show the different elements of our Cascadia's West Coast research and stranding response is one key part of it. And Port Townsend Marine Science Center is a major partner um, in that response. But we also work with uh, other species up and down the coast mm -hmm. Uh, doing uh, uh, often some similar research efforts. Uh, our three primary species are humpback whales, blue whales, and gray whales. And I'm not going to talk at all about humpback and blue whales uh, in this talk, uh, but I'd contrast that some of the approaches we use with gray whales, our approaches we're also applying and using with some of these other species from some of what you'll see with the long-term photo ID database or the tag deployments or the evaluating different human threats uh, and how they affect these populations of gray whales. You know, one key element of our gray whale research that holds across all three of those species are these long-term photographic identification databases. Uh, for each of those three species, these have gotten, you know, We've documented tens of thousands of encounters uh, with uh, whales where we've been able to identify them based on natural markings to individual species. And here you'll see, you know, we do a lot of work with our small boats, uh, like what you see in the top left here with humpback whales using the underside of the fluke, gray whales here just below that. Hey, hold on, John. We can't see your screen. Can you go back to screen share? Oh, yes, absolutely. Let's see. <laughs> Thank Let's you. Let's see what went wrong there. Uh, let's try again. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, was that the case for a little while? Uh, well, anyway, I won't go back. Uh, I don't we think there was too much. Yeah, we might have missed one before. I don't know. Okay. Okay. It didn't have too much right. on it. I'll just keep going from here. Okay. Um, and you'll see this table in the lower left here. It summarizes these long-term photo ID catalogs. Our humpback whale catalog uh, uh, has over 7,000 individuals. We began it in the 1980s, 100,000 encounters. And now it's also become part of uh, Happy Whale, an online database and catalog that we share information with back and forth as well. Uh, but you'll see gray whales on the second row where we have several thousand individuals we track uh, and over 30,000 encounters. And we use this type of information to track uh, in these three arrows show, you know, abundance trends of these different species, uh, migrations, movements, and interchange uh, among different areas, and then following up different human impacts, including survival and entanglements. So now getting to these different groups and, and uh, I'm wondering if anyone will have caught a subtle change in the title of this talk for today. It referred to three groups and three stories, but I ended up turning it into four groups. <laughs> so I, uh, uh, as I sort of really thought about it, I really should cover the Western gray whales. So I added a fourth group that uh, maybe doesn't play a large role here, but it is, it does occur in Washington waters and I wanted to speak to it. And so these four different groups, and I'm gonna 
I have a, a couple of slides introducing these four groups. And then I'm going to talk about each one individually. And then I'll try to reintegrate them together a little bit at the end. We'll see if I pull that off. Uh, but first of all is the overall Eastern North Pacific gray whale population. This is uh, what's primarily recognized by uh, U.S. managers at National Marine Fishery Science, uh, National Marine Fishery Service. Uh, and this is the group that migrates from breeding grounds in Mexico up to their primary feeding grounds in the Arctic. They generally migrate past Washington State southbound coming from their feeding grounds and going to those winter breeding grounds in December. And they're mostly doing that more offshore, though we'll get a few stragglers coming into Washington state uh, inside waters. And then they migrate northbound uh, in March through May, passing the Washington coast at that time. Now, the Sounders gray whales, which is our second group, is actually a small group of whales that breaks off from this Eastern North Pacific group and comes into Northern Puget Sound and feeds every spring, generally from March through May, though the timing of that has expanded. And, and as I'll show you when we get into talking about the Sounders, this group has expanded quite a bit from an original small group of a half dozen whales we first documented in the early 1990s, now numbering more than 20 whales. But that original group of a half dozen whales, we've continued to see uh, you know, four out of six of those whales through the most recent years. So they've you know, stayed and kept returning for over 30 years. They feed mostly on ghost shrimp in this area uh, and I hope to show you how they came to be, if you will. This third group, the Pacific Coast Feeding Group, which uh, you'll hear me refer to as the PCFG, uh, matching the acronym for that, uh, are a group of several hundred whales uh, that we generally consider distinct from the overall Eastern North Pacific gray whale uh, population. But uh, not everyone agrees on whether they qualify as a distinct group. And for example, National Marine Fishery Service does not treat them as a distinct group, uh, but Canada does. Uh, these, group, these animals come and feed primarily in the Pacific Northwest from Northern California up through British Columbia. Uh, and they're, they're there typically from March through often November, with some animals even staying through the winter and overwintering uh, in that area. And they engage in some unique feeding behavior in that uh, area, and most of them do not migrate further north. And then the fourth group is uh, what are termed Western gray whales. And these were whales that uh, were described quite a while ago and are still studied today that feed in the Western North Pacific, primarily in areas like off Sakhalin Island in the Sea of Okhotsk in Russia. Um, but more recently, their status has become more uh, confused, let's say, because it was originally thought those whales uh, were part of a separate winter breeding population that bred somewhere off China and Korea in the Western North Pacific. But more recent research has revealed at least the current whales feeding in that area, most of them, in fact, come and migrate across the Pacific down to the Eastern North Pacific breeding areas off Mexico. Uh, they number only in a few hundred, they're considered endangered. Uh, there were documented genetic differences in both mitochondrial and nuclear DNA to the overall Eastern North Pacific population. Uh, but now with the fact they also occur in the Eastern North Pacific, that story has become a little more complicated. And just to look at these you know, four stories now more graphically on a map. <laughs> you know, here you have the overall Eastern North Pacific population. It breeds down here in Mexico in red. Um, Diane, could you confirm, can you see my cursor? Okay, good. So I'm circling the area where they breed off Baja. They make this long migration 
up the coast and their primary feeding areas are up here in Arctic waters stretching from the northern Bering Sea uh, you know, up into you know, the Beaufort and Chukchi Seas. Uh, so that's that overall Eastern North Pacific gray whale population I mentioned. The sounders that I talked about that break off from this migration come over here and feed in uh, Northern Puget Sound. And in the inset map, here's the primary area of the sounders, a little small area uh, in here, especially around Whidbey and Kamano Island that we'll look at in, in far more detail shortly. Uh, and uh, that group generally there in spring, though in recent years, expanding their time period before they seem to continue on up into the Arctic. That third group I mentioned, the Pacific Coast Feeding Group, PCFG, is more shown in green here as their primary range. We've gone ahead and stretched this range up past into Southeast Alaska and Kodiak because we've had matches, you know, fairly frequent matches in this area, but their primary area of use is from Northern British Columbia here down through Northern California is their primary area of use. And then finally over here is the Western North Pacific gray whale population. This is the Sea of Okhotsk. My map doesn't quite show it, but their main feeding area is it off Sakhalin Island, which is over here where my cursor is a little bit off to the left of my map. Now, gray whales are, um, you know, one of their hallmarks is this benthic feeding, uh, where they are known for feeding uh, on the bottom. Uh, and this kind of led maybe some early descriptions of gray whales and their feeding behavior to view them as this highly specialized feeders. You know, this is an aerial view of a gray whale, its head here, its tail here, and it's gone down and sucked in a slurry of uh, sediment and water, and it's filtered it through, creating this mud plume that trails behind it. Uh, and this is a characteristic view uh, from the air of a gray whale uh, feeding. And in areas of northern Puget Sound, which I'm going to uh, explore in a little more detail, these gray whales actually feed in the intertidal zone. And so at low tide, you can actually view uh, exposed above water the areas they'd been feeding. And this is an aerial view of an intertidal uh, mudflat uh, off, off of Whidbey Island. Uh, and each of these little dimples you see are depressions about six feet long and three or four feet wide left in the mud from a gray whale feeding there at high tide when there was just barely enough water for it to get in there. And by using the suction to suck in and filter the sediment, it actually created one of these feeding pits. And they were successfully able to remove, in this case, a lot of the ghost shrimp that we're using that area. And these types of images are even available. And this image down here, for example, uh, is actually just the blow up of a Google Earth image that you could call up yourself. Uh, uh, and uh, this is from the Snohomish River Delta. Uh, and if you blew it up enough, you can see it actually shows these gray whale feeding pits in some of the images available on Google Earth that are taken in the spring at low tide. And we've actually used this, and I'll show you some of the results of that, to document tens of thousands of gray whale feeding pits that you can document from these satellite aerial images. Now, what that looks like from the water is when gray whales are feeding in the intertidal zone, it will look something like this, where the gray whales are just barely have enough water to submerge themselves. These are portions of peck fins and uh, flukes that are above the water as these whales try to feed in this extremely shallow water. Oh, and I guess before I leave this, I should say that you know, while all of this, and in fact, this is a very specialized, unique feeding, you know, up in the Arctic on the bottom on amphilicid amphipods or down here for the sounders uh, on ghost shrimp. Uh, we've really learned that gray whales are an incredibly versatile feeder. In fact, compared 
to all the other baleen whales, uh, they are probably the most versatile of the feeders because not only do they employ this bottom feeding, but they also will feed in the water column, uh, trying to engulf prey. They'll feed in and among kelp beds and trying to access uh, mycid shrimp swarms. They'll skim feed at the surface uh, on prey right along the surface. They'll even feed on krill uh, alongside gray whales. Uh, so they've actually shown themselves to be highly versatile. And as we explore some of the challenges gray whales have feed, the reason for that evolved versatility will become clearer. Now the gray whale population has been monitored over many years uh, by surveys with uh, uh, land counts being done in different areas. And there are a number of sites where some of these land observations are done, but the primary ones uh, that have been run by NOAA have been counts made during the southbound migration from a land observation point just south of Monterey Bay at Yankee Point. And those counts have been used to then develop indexes and correction factors over proportion of whales migrating out of the range of view or migrating at night uh, when observations couldn't be conducted uh, or uh, being missed by the observers uh, or occurring earlier or later than the observation. And that combination of correction factors uh, has been modified over the years. Uh, but this is from one of the more recent papers by uh, Josh Stewart and Dave Weller, kind of summarizing some of the counts of gray whales going back to the 1970s. But some of these counts go earlier than that. And gray whales were largely considered a major success story in having bounced back from whaling. And most of that was from this period through the 1990s when this kind of steady uh, uh, increase and recovery of gray whales going from what was thought to be maybe a few thousand uh, when they were most depleted by commercial whaling now recovering back to close to what was thought to be their historical numbers. And you can see here peaking at over 25,000 in the late 1980s. Uh, but then the story since then is uh, like many things with gray whales has become more complicated. And now you see a series of pretty wide variations in the estimates that have come from these counts. And at first that may not make a lot of sense, but I'm gonna come back to this figure and look at it in relation to a few other things and make sense a little bit of what has happened since then. And I think uh, here in our observations in Washington, we have a little bit of a unique insight and perspective into some of that. But you can see that uh, you know gray whale numbers have generally still fluctuated between about 15 and 25,000 in most of these years, just topping out above 25,000 in a few of these years. Now, one of the more dramatic changes is occurring right now. And uh, this is what's termed the 2019 gray whale unusual mortality event. And the UME unusual mortality event has a bit of a formality to it because it is something formally recognized by NOAA. NOAA has a, an expert team that I've served on, you know, that evaluates mortalities of different marine mammals in, you, you know, uh, you know, that the U.S. is involved with, you know, and, you know, declares these unusual mortality events when these exceed normal levels. Uh, and gray whales have gone to, gone through two declared unusual mortality events. And as I'll show you, a third one that predated the designation of unusual mortality event. But let's start for a second with this current one that we're in, uh, because this is what's dominating some of the news now. It's certainly affecting us here in Washington state and our observations of gray whales. Uh, and so I wanted to focus on it for a second. First of all, this unusual mortality event started in 2019 with some early indications of it in 2018. Uh, it has the number of animals, you know, has dropped each year in terms of these are number of dead animals 
uh, documented uh, in each of the three countries that gray whales kind of migrate through, uh, going from their, again, breeding areas in Mexico, migration routes in US and Canada, and then ending up with their feeding areas up here, mostly back in US waters. Uh, and you'll see that, you know, in each of these years, starting in 2019, you know, over a hundred gray whales were documented uh, washing up. Uh, and this is a subset from 2019, the first major year of the locations of those mortalities. And you can see they're spread through the whole range of gray whales. Um, and if you plotted this for all four years, it would look fairly similar, just many more circles spread through this area. Uh, and you'll see the timing of that mortality event over here in this graph by month. And you can see most of that mortality is generally documented from spring in March through early to midsummer in July. But the mortalities have been documented in every month of the year. Uh, so this has been the source of quite a bit of uh, uh, kind of both research, speculation, you know, and evaluation in, in recent years, evaluating this unusual mortality event. Now, in Washington state, uh, we can put together a, a little bit of a, more of a long-term data series, if you will. Uh, and what's nice about this is uh, partly because of very active uh, stranding response groups going back to the 1970s, the involvement of the Washington Depart Department of Fish and Wildlife, the presence of the National Marine Mammal Lab in Seattle, uh, and then many other groups, uh, including Cascadia, the Port Townsend Marine Science Center, but even some groups that aren't active now, like the Marine Animal Resource Center. We have actually had a fairly consistent documentation of gray whale strandings in Washington state going back to the late 70s. And so this chart goes from 1977 uh, through 2022 and shows the annual number of strandings documented of gray whales in Washington state waters. And you can see that in most years, it's under five. And the average, you know, is in the five to 10 neighborhood, depending on whether you include these unusual mortality event years. Um, and for Washington state, our mortality is shifted and a little more concentrated uh, from April uh, through June or the three top months for Washington state. But you see signs of the same, you know, March through July, August that you saw in the overall unusual mortality event. But I think this chart really gives us an ability to look at how much these unusual mortality event years differ from the other years. And so now uh, let me, oh, dang. Okay, I'm gonna go backwards. Uh, uh, I, I, I thought I had one more chart and I wanna highlight three periods here. One is here's our current unusual mortality event year, 2019 to 2022. You can see this elevated mortality in, in all four of these years above average. Uh, here you see that 1999-2000 unusual mortality event pair of years. This was the previous declared unusual mortality event year. But then I'm gonna come back later to point out a third. The next highest pair of years is from 1990-91. And that was pre the declaration of these unusual mortality events. Uh, but you'll see how that pair of years is gonna factor into some other things later on. Now, if we look at a blow up of our strandings in Washington state uh, across all these years, and most of these are on shore, but you'll see a few locations offshore where a carcass was documented drifting. Uh, and these are a uh, number of strandings uh, by, uh, by, by degree of latitude uh, going up the coast. Uh, and the main thing you'll see is the strandings occur all along the US West Coast, and they also occur throughout the inside waters and the straits. Though you can see the density of these relative to shoreline is much lower 
in the inside waters than it is on the outer coast, as you might expect, uh, given that the majority of the overall population is migrating just along this outer coast and only a portion of these animals are either swimming in alive into inside waters or in some cases drifting dead <laughs> into inside waters. Uh, and you'll also see that the highest density of sightings uh, you know, per degree of latitude occurs down here in the southern portion of the state and drops in the northern portion. And these are areas where there are these long flat beaches uh, with uh, a shallow slope uh, where carcasses that get caught into the surf get pushed up on the shore uh, and they're frequently visited. There are beaches that are driven along. And as you get further up the coast, you get into more remote areas rocky shorelines and headlands, not those shallow things. So I think both you have fewer carcasses washing up and perhaps you have a lower rate of discovery of those carcasses and they're less likely to stay in place. Now for all of these charts, whether it's the by month, by year or location, you have to bear in mind that these documented strandings represent a small portion of the true mortality. We actually think it's something closer to five to 10 times as many animals are dying than go documented. And that's because most of these animals that die are emaciated, they sink when they die, and if they sink in any kind of deep enough waters, even the forces of bloating won't counteract the water pressure and they'll become these whale falls that'll feed the benthic community uh, in the areas where they sink. So these represent a small portion of mortality. So you can well understand how when you document hundreds of these strandings, like in these UME events, uh, the true number is actually in the, potentially in the thousands of animals. And you'll see how that holds up when we link some of these pieces of data. You'll all, uh, looking at the Washington state data, you'll also see that the size classes of these animals tend to come in, in sort of a, what we call a dichotomous distribution. Uh, you have uh, more juvenile animals, typically animals that are calves or yearlings or two, two or three year olds that are seen here. Uh, and they're split with uh, slightly more females than males uh, in that group. And then we also have adult animals. And there you'll see a little size class difference here in, uh, uh, in these intermediate size to smaller adult whales. They're dominated by males, the red bars. Uh, and as you get into the largest size classes, they're documented by, they're dominated by females which again reflect that sexual dimorphism that exists in adult gray whales as exists in other baleen whales where the females tend to be slightly larger than the males. And that's reflected in this record uh, here. Now we've also come to learn that the size classes of dead whales don't necessarily match up with some of the historical records of uh, how big different age classes of uh, gray whales should be. And we've actually come to realize that many of the younger gray whales that strand are actually fairly stunted in growth. Uh, and this is work that uh, Jesse Huggins, along with some of our collaborators along the West Coast have developed that kind of have developed a way to classify calves of the year by Julian Day uh, through the year and kind of showing a way to tell which are likely calves of the year, which are shown in red from these animals that other indications showed were not calves of the year. When there was a temptation to want to classify some of these other animals as likely calves, they were not. And that partly was because uh, the calves that were dying were tended to be smaller than we expected them to be. Okay. Okay, finally, I get to that slide I promised earlier where, where I was going to highlight the three time periods. Well, here are the three time periods, but we already talked about them. So I'll, I'll jump over those. <clears throat> now, I notice, and you may, if you're watching the clock at all, 
that I'm over a half hour into my talk and I'm still on the first of the four groups of gray whales. Um, so uh, this is always a risk. So I'm gonna try to go a little faster. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna talk just a little bit more about the overall population and gray whale deaths, but I wanna to get to our other groups uh, quickly. Uh, these gray whales that die uh, in Washington state, especially many are very thin or emaciated. Uh, both the whales that we find dead, but also some of the stragglers we see swimming around alive. Uh, there's a variety of other causes of death, some of them involving human interactions, entanglements, and ship strikes. But even some of those whales appear to be emaciated, and we think those represent potentially debilitated whales that are more vulnerable uh, to interactions with human activities. Uh, and because these whales, after they die, will often bloat, to know they're emaciated or thin can actually be a little bit tricky. And you can have a whale like here that looks very emaciated or thin because it's very fresh. But this whale, after several days laying on the beach, will bloat and it will actually look like a fat whale. Um, so we've actually been trying to use other indicators, looking at the blubber layer that you see here and looking at how oily it is. Uh, and we found that many of these whales, their blubber instead of being oily is very dry or fibrousy or sometimes even a little watery. Uh, and when we test it, have very low levels of lipids, often under 5% lipids in the blubber. Lipids are fats. So, um, you know, unlike the way we think of our fat where, you know, if we don't have much fat, it goes away. In this case of this blubber layer in gray whales, the blubber layer may still be there. It may get a little thinner, but it will also have given up most of its lipids and have very little fat or nutritional content left. Uh, we have documented even an increase in killer whale attacks on gray whales, especially in the last few years. Uh, in 1921 and 22, 30% of the gray whales we find, uh, uh, we found just in these last two years, which again were slightly decreased years compared to the, the, the big UME years of 2019 and 2020. But a third of them showed signs of having been attacked and killed by killer whales. So I think there's some interaction going on there as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, killer whales are known predators on especially gray whale calves. And I think they've been able to take advantage of uh, some of these debilitated gray whales in these UME years. I mentioned other causes of death. I'm gonna to touch on some of these a little more in a second. Uh, now, I did wanna mention that, you know, we also deal with live gray whales from entangled whales to live stranded gray whales uh, like this one. This was one we learned a lot from that live stranded in August, 2017 near Claylock. Uh, this whale, unlike some of the other live stranded whales still seem to be uh, fairly uh, lively, if you will. It was trying to free itself, but it, it had gotten buried in the very soft sand uh, of this beach and this very shallow beach that came in. We think that happened because this was an area and a time period that we had an unusually high number of mostly Pacific Coast feeding group, PCFG whales, feeding right in the surf zone. We believe feeding mostly on razor clams. And this young whale appeared to be trying to do that and got caught up uh, in the breakers and pushed into shore and then was unable to free itself. And even though it was stranded for two to three days, uh, we were actually able to refloat this whale uh, it was a difficult area to access from shore or by boat. Uh, and we actually utilized a crew on the beach, you know, rigging up a harness around this whale and a pulley system offshore. And then a group of uh, people pulling to help free the whale at high tide as it tried to free itself. We could use uh, our harness system uh, and pulley system to help maximize its gain and keep it from losing ground with each new breaker coming in. And we're able to free that whale. Okay, just to uh, recap a few things about the UME that um, 
you know, and we'll come back to some of these. Uh, this involved the Eastern North Pacific gray whale population. Uh, we have not documented mortalities similar in the Pacific Coast feeding group uh, of gray whales. This seems to be this overall Eastern North Pacific gray whale group that uh, is the subject of the UME. Uh, its numbers were really high prior to the UME. Uh, there are dramatic changes occurring in the Arctic and uh, things like ice cover that we worry might be affecting the prey of gray whales in that area. But one of the puzzling things has been, at least going back historically, gray whales seem to benefit from lower ice cover because it let them access areas deeper into the Arctic uh, and earlier in the year than was possible in high ice cover year. And there was a correlation between uh, that ice cover in years of in years of lower ice cover, there was actually an increase in gray whale calf production in subsequent years. Uh, uh, maybe I won't spend too much time on these and come back later because some of these involve some of these uh, ties I'll get to later. Uh, I'm gonna skip over a few things and now jump to the PCFG gray whales because uh, I wanna talk about them uh, next. Uh, this is this group of gray whales that feeds, again, Northern California to British Columbia, numbers in the few hundred. It was first documented in the 1970s by Jim Darling in work along the west coast of Vancouver Island. But when you look back through historical records and accounts of gray whales, you actually see uh, there were many reports of what were called out of season or summer gray whales occurring on the west coast that likely reflected PCFG gray whales. We began our concerted effort in the early 1980s, documenting these and trying to extend some of the work Jim Darling had done off Vancouver Island to the entire range of the PCFG gray whales. Uh, we began the Sounders gray whale work that I'll talk about in a second in the 1990, but our work with PCFG whales actually predated that. It was partly benefited by regular support starting in the mid to late 1990s by the National Marine Mammal Laboratory. Uh, and it's really benefited by a series of collaborators working along the range of the PCFG. In particular, uh, Brian Gisborne, uh, uh, some of you may know of him. He ran a water taxi surface along the southwest coast of Vancouver Island. and began gathering data on the gray whales he documented there through the summer. And he is the largest single contributor uh, to our catalog of gray whales and has single-handedly really uh, advanced the science on these whales. So I want to do a shout out to him. Uh, most recently in 2020, there's now actually even a consortium that we're a part of called the PCFG Consortium that is trying to promote further research on the PCFG gray whales. Uh, this is not a slide I intend you to read, but it basically has years uh, on the across the top and different collectors just to show the large number of major contributors to this overall PCFG catalog we've had. Uh, to highlight the key elements of our work with PCFG gray whales, uh, you know, we do focus primarily on this region uh, where PCFG whales occur. And we primarily focus on the you know, summer and fall when we don't have migrating whales going by, but we have included gray whales during the spring and in other areas to kind of contrast with the PCFG whales. Uh, so even though we have over 2000 individual whales in our catalog, uh, uh, it's actually only about 300 of those whales, 15%, account for over 80% of the encounters. So mostly it's dominated by these re-sightings of these PCFG regular whales. Okay, uh, let's see. I don't think I'm gonna be labor this to, this This shows some of the different milestones in the work. Um, uh, we've had collaborators working in different areas along the coast and this identifies, we've actually produced annual reports updating the Pacific Coast feeding group abundance. Uh, and 
Uh, we update that annually, and it usually includes uh, co-authors from the Marine Mammal Lab and from Cascadia, but involves contributions from many of these uh, other individuals up and down the coast. And I'll take all of the abundance estimation and put it on this one figure, which this shows you what's been the trend in the Pacific Coast feeding group abundance. And you'll actually see in the early years, we documented what appeared to be an increase. But starting in the early 2000s, this population has actually remained remarkably stable, generally numbering between about 200 and 250 ray whales. Um, and so uh, it's been very consistent and much more consistent than those estimates of the overall Eastern North Pacific gray whale population. And that's one of the reasons you'll see at the end as I put these different threads together that I show that uh, these PCFG whales are not being affected by the unusual mortality event of gray whales. Uh, we have documented that many of these PCFG gray whales, this is from a couple of papers we did a few years ago, tend to even associate together on their southbound and northbound migration as they go down to their breeding lagoons uh, in Mexico. So even though they interbreed with uh, Eastern North Pacific, the larger Eastern North Pacific gray whales, uh, they do tend to migrate on their own uh, and often primarily associated with other PCFG gray whales. And we've documented that uh, they're very stable in their identity and mo most of the recruitment of new whales to the PCFG are calves of known PCFG mothers that come with their calves to this area and then their calves adopt this same feeding strategy. And I won't belabor that point. Uh, how gray whales are designated varies in different areas between the US and Canada, for example. I won't belabor that point, uh, uh, but just that uh, in the U.S., we recognize an eastern and a western North Pacific gray whale, but we don't recognize the PCFG, uh, whereas Canada does. Uh, okay, let's go on. Uh, as we talk about the PCFG, uh, an important element is the macaw hunt, and I want to mention a few things about that. Uh, starting in late 1990s, the macaw proposed as uh, the Eastern North Pacific gray whale population was taken off the endangered species list, they resumed their traditional hunt of gray whales and they took one whale in May, 1999 uh, as a part of that. Uh, I, I heard maybe some noise on the mic. Uh, Diane, were you trying to say something? Okay, sorry, I'm still not hearing anything, but I assume I'm still clear to go on. Okay. Um, I, uh, I will point out that uh, the macaw hunt uh, after this 99, 1999 hunt uh, was challenged, uh, whether uh, um, a full environmental impact statement should have been written over it and whether a formal exclusion to the Marine Mammal Protection Act uh, should have been applied for and passed. So currently that has been winding through a long legal procedure and actually making headway. I'm not sure when we'll see it because now we're still, now we're over 20 years past this, uh, but uh, at some point in coming years uh, that should be completed. Uh, and we will likely see a resumption of the macaw hunt. Um, this is something that the macaw tribe have sought. Their treaty from 1865, uh, they're one of the only tribes that had language in their treaty, uh, specifically naming uh, their uh, rights to continue whaling in them. Uh, and so uh, I think they have a really strong treaty rights for that, but how to integrate that treaty right with some of the more modern legislation and status is partly what has taken a while uh, you know, to develop and work through. I'll just say a few more things about uh, our work with the PCFG. 
you know, we'll be continuing to maintain our catalog and do these annual abundance estimates. Uh, we will, we're, we were about to add a new annual abundance estimate through 2021. We are looking at uh, publishing and having available through the PCFG consortium, an online catalog summary of the PCFG whales. Uh, there are some studies uh, like Anna Blanchard, a graduate student is comparing our, that catalog to the San Ignacio, uh, the Mexican breeding area catalogs of known mothers and calves using a new automated alg algorithms. Um, so anyway, there are a number of steps underway under that. Okay, with that, I'm gonna try to move to our third group of gray whales, which are the Sounders gray whales of Northern Puget Sound, the portion of that Eastern North Pacific gray whales that break off from their <laughs> migration and that we've uh, started to study and document in 1990. And I'm going to focus for a second on this little bit of a complicated chart uh, that you don't have to read. That's why it's color coded. And across the top are years starting with 1990 and going through 2022. Uh, and where there's a color, it means that whale was documented in that year. Each of the rows is a different identified sounder gray whale. Starting with the first two gray whales we ever documented using Northern Puget Sound, which was uh, Shackleton and Earhart, our whales 21 and 22, uh, which I'll, I'll just say our numbers represent uh, uh, the 21st and 22nd whale we ever cataloged in our gray whale catalog. And you can see now we're up in the thousands, but that kind of shows you how early on we identified these Sounders gray whales and how regularly they've returned. And you'll notice a couple of things that I'm going to then highlight later on is that you'll see there were six gray whales that here joined this group in 1990-91 and then have continued on. Uh, you'll see another six gray whales that joined this group around 1999-2000. And then you'll see a third time period starting primarily in 2019, where a third group of Sounders gray whales uh, joined and started returning. Now, I have not put on here every gray whale that we've seen in uh, the northern Puget Sound area, but have only listed whales that we've seen in more than one year. So there are some whales that we see that we never see again. Uh, but among the whales that we see more than one year, once they seem to have discovered and know to return to this year, you can see then they generally tend to return many more years uh, after that. <coughs> Most of these whales have been identified as males, which is in this column here, but we do have a few notable females. And a couple of these females uh, we've documented and I'll show you later on primarily with UAS data, uh, has likely having been pregnant. Uh, but these female gray whales tend to be the ones like you'll take Earhart, the second whale in this column, and you'll see that every three to five years, we did not see Earhart come into the sound. And we suspect each of those years were years that she had a calf because we never saw Earhart with a calf. And we were able to validate that in 2020, when the UAS uh, surveys identified that she looked pregnant, it lined up perfectly with her not being seen the following year. Uh, okay. Uh, I do want to point out that two of our regular Sounders gray whales, I mean, one of the amazing thing about the Sounders gray whales has been their longevity that once these whales are seen multiple years, we've continued to see them. Uh, but now there are two uh, exceptions that have emerged. Uh, Patch, whale 49, that we first documented in 1991, and we saw almost every year through 2020, so over a 30 year period, was not seen in 2021 or 2022, and we now presume is dead. Now, having first been identified in 91 as an adult and having been seen 30 years after that, 
that says that whale was probably 35 to 40 years old at least. Uh, so that what's more surprising about these sounders gray whales has been their high survival rate, despite those major mortality events that these whales survived through. And we'll come back to that point. And then another whale, Dubnuck whale 44, uh, uh, first seen in 1991, was seen through 2022, but the last time we saw it in 2022, uh, it had wandered away from Northern Puget Sound. It looked extremely emaciated and in very poor condition, and we have not seen it since. Um, so we suspect that we've now lost two of these sounders gray whales. Okay, let me move. I'm going to move on and skip a few slides here. Uh, uh, I want to mention the UIS work that I've referred to. This is done by John Durbin and Holly Fernbaugh uh, in collaboration. It goes back uh, now several years that we've now been doing that work. They've done the pioneering work measuring body condition in the southern resident killer whales. And now we're kind of developing similar tracking of these sounders gray whales, measuring their body condition very precisely. And these are photographs from their work, you know, showing and looking at, uh, you know, uh, the relationship between length and girth as a way to measure body condition. And these are different sounders gray whales. And when we measured them, and you can see we're getting many repeat measurements of the same whale in 2021 and 22. Uh, we can plot their body condition and how they change uh, over time and show that these whales generally gain body condition. That's what these plots indicate, that width to length ratio improves during the time they're feeding in the sound. Uh, and that's also how we documented some of these pregnant animals, you know, whereas maximum girth, you know, in most of these whales occurs a little bit farther forward. Sometimes we see this broader girth that's further back in animals like this is whale 22 that we mentioned was documented uh, pregnant in uh, uh, 2020 and it appeared to give birth to a calf in 2021. A whale we documented as likely pregnant in 2021, whale 531, a known female, did show up the following year and did not have a calf with her. So we suspect uh, she either, uh, she likely lost her calf. Okay. I'm going to skip a few of these slides uh, and just uh, jump ahead to some current projects and get to my integration slides just because uh, we're an hour in. Uh, we are going to be continuing our work with the Sounders gray whales. In fact, we're just kicking off our season. And especially since we're seeing dramatic changes, we've had two of the regular Sounders gray whales show up in winter this year and uh, bypass their southern migration and start feeding through the winter and apparently on their way to feeding through the spring. So as some of these whales face challenges on their Arctic feeding grounds, they're learning to you know, exploit this unique feeding area uh, in the Sounders area and do it even more. So we have more whales feeding longer you know, and even sometimes overwintering to feed. We are going to be deploying additional suction cup tags on these whales to document their feeding behavior. We have a new focus on some of the vocal behavior on whales. Uh, in, and uh, maybe I'll jump to this slide. Uh, we did receive a grant through the US EPA, through the National Estuarine Program, uh, to specifically look at uh, the Sounders gray whales, the gray whales that feed in Puget Sound and better understand both their increased use of Puget Sound, but also some of the threats and mortalities that has resulted in that. We're excited to have a new PhD graduate student, Hannah Clayton, starting her PhD program uh, at Stanford focused on energetics and feeding of the Sounders gray whales. Uh, she started work with us last year and started her PhD program uh, just this season. Uh, we will be expanding those deployments of suction cup tags. There is a, a couple of film crews that will be, have become very interested in the Sounders gray whales. So there'll be some additional, uh, you know, studies going on there that we'll at least collaborate with, but will be somewhat independent from as well. 
And as part of that NEP grant, we'll be collaborating more with groups like CDOC Society, Orca Academy, uh, that are part of this uh, uh, NEP grant. Uh, and we'll be with CDOC, for example, we'll be producing a show for their sound series uh, on the Sounders gray whales. I did mention tag deployments. Uh, I think I'll just show one you know, brief clip of these. We've deployed these in previous years. They've documented that the gray whales in the, the Sounders gray whales feed primarily at high tide. This is a graph showing data of the dive depth of gray whales. This is the tidal cycle in orange that you see going up and down. And in these blue red periods right here, 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 and here is when the gray whales were feeding. This gray whale that was tagged was feeding. In this case, uh, you know, uh, 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 this was whale 723. And uh, you can see the feeding coincided with the periods leading up to the high tide and just through the high tide when they could access those intertidal go shrimp beds. And you know, these tags give us video images and sound. You know, this is off the back of one of the first whales we tagged. You'll hear some of the water flow going by. We discovered that these whales often make contact with each other, <laughs> like occurred there, moving our tags around and pressing them back down. Down here, you see that uh, we get all of this different sensor data off the tags. Uh, that's been valuable in interpreting their behavior. Uh, we can use it to document their feeding behavior. Uh, you know, uh, actually, let me go on to this. You know, here's like a gray whale feeding on the bottom. It, it breathes and then it's at the bottom immediately because it's right there. You can see some of the ghost shrimp uh, holes right there. It creates a little, uh, stirs up the mud right where it makes contact with the bottom. And then once it puts its head on the bottom, it holds position and you'll see it'll start uh, filter feeding and sucking in this mud slurry. And you'll see this go by here as it tries to filter out uh, the uh, mixture of mud and go shrimp, one of which gets away and goes by right there. Okay, and now very quickly, I'm gonna to touch on the fourth group of gray whales just to show you a couple of slides uh, from some of the satellite tagging of those gray whales that. Uh, you know, I mentioned here Sokolin Island where they fed. This was a gray whale tagged by Bruce Mate and Oregon State University uh, and published in 2015. That ended up showing that this whale, instead of migrating south like we expected it, instead crossed the Bering Sea, crossed the Gulf of Alaska, came over here to Washington State, and then started to migrate south before the tag failed in February of 2011. Uh, since then, other tag deployments have documented other of these western gray whales crossing the North Pacific and coming over to the east to then, and some of those have even documented their feeding areas in Baja. Uh, okay, so let me jump ahead. I was going to talk about entanglements and uh, some of the threats gray whales face from entanglements. Uh, some of the success we've had in some cases freeing some of these gray whales uh, as uh, occurred in 2020 uh, off Port Angeles uh, and we were able to free a gray whale. And now let's get to this integration portion. Uh, and uh, for example, I had shown you this chart of uh, gray whale mortality in Washington state, which are these bars going back to 1977. And now in gray are the number of gray whales corresponding to this chart on the right that joined the sounders. And you can see when we had the sounders, new sounders join, it was in 1990 and 91, in 1999, 2000, and starting here in 2018 and 2019 and extending. And these two periods are the periods of the unusual mortality events. And this was that third area of elevated mortality clear in our own record. And so as we asked the question, what would have driven gray whales to break off from their migration, travel 100, 150 miles you know, into the Salish Sea 
and explore and discover this high risk feeding in the intertidal zone? The answer is desperation. It corresponds to these periods when these gray whales that primarily feed in the Arctic, which the sounders mostly do, were facing major nutritional stress and were in a desperate search for new feeding areas. Okay, now let's link that stranding record in Washington state to the population trend data I showed you from the Stewart and Weller paper. And as you recall, that showed this growing population up to the late 1980s, then a major decrease in the early 1990s, a major decrease that you see lines up with 1999, 2000, and then a major decrease straddling 2019. Uh, and I haven't added, there's been another estimate since the Stewart and Weller that shows the abundance down here closer to 15,000. So this has continued to come down. And once again, you'll see that these estimates of mortality, uh, both corresponding to the larger UME, but also is very clearly evident in our Washington record, exactly correspond to these major drops in the estimates of the overall gray whale population. And they confirm that speculation uh, that not only is it hundreds of whales dying as documented in the unusual mortality events, but when you look at these decreases in the overall abundance, these are thousands of whales disappearing from the estimated overall Pacific population, corresponding to the fact that the strandings and mortalities we're documenting represent only a small portion of the true mortality. And again, this is looking at some of these, again, now uh, you know, drawing these together, peaks in Washington gray whale strandings clearly match up with drops in gray whale abundance, the discovery by the sounders of new whales, uh, and they link together really well. Uh, we've also found that those uh, years of higher mortality link up with when we see more gray whales in unusual areas where gray whales don't normally feed and actually show there are more of these wandering, you know, desperate gray whales that unlike the sounders are not successfully finding new areas to feed. Okay, and finally our conclusions, uh, you know, which I don't know, I sort of debated what to put in this list, but it's mostly, you know, that these whales have very different stories, but there's interesting connections among them. Uh, new whales that have joined the sounders are clearly related to the high mortality years. Ooh, that's not. With most returning whales uh, then becoming regular parts of the sounders. Uh, the sounders have actually shown remarkable survival and have survived these UME events. So even as these huge mortality events were occurring, sometimes killing off a third of the estimated gray whale population, the sounders whales that have discovered this new feeding area were actually being incredibly successful. And we've only recently seen a few of those whales start to, to drop off, in some cases more than 30 years after they've been using uh, this area. So they've obviously benefited tremendously uh, from feeding in this high density ghost shrimp area. Um, we've discovered that our Washington state strandings, while they represent only a small portion of the overall mortality and uh, gray whale deaths along their range, they actually seem to be a remarkably uh, good indicator <laughs> uh, of other things going on in the gray whale population. And you can see that in addition to the sounders having used their feeding strategy to survive the UMEs, the PCFG gray whales and the Western North Pacific gray whales have not been impacted by the UME in the same ways uh, as uh, the Eastern North Pacific gray whales feeding in the Arctic. And that helps really focus in that this unusual mortality event uh, is really related to the dynamics of number of whales and prey availability to them in the Arctic. And these whales from Western North Pacific gray whales, PCFG gray whales, or Sounders gray whales that feed in the spring and other areas have found ways to uh, basically weather 
what is affecting the larger gray whale population. Uh, and I think it represents part of this maybe strategy that gray whales have had, the versatility of gray whales that we've, bringing it back to the first point I tried to make, that we've discovered gray whales as a more complicated, versatile animal uh, that falls into these different groups and a, a more wide variety of feeding strategies and prey types that may be needed by gray whales because sole reliance on a single prey type or area to feed like in the Arctic does make them vulnerable uh, you know, to variations in that.